to episode number 48 of The Week in Strange. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in live on Facebook today. Uh, we're not going to be having Timony here uh, hosting the show, so it's just going to be me and Thomas. It's going to be the boys' show tonight. So, uh, Thomas, uh, how are you? I don't think I, I had a chance to, to ask you that. You're, you're, uh, my, my audio is fucked up over here. How have you been? Uh, I'm okay. The, the weather's crap here. It might as well be winter. So it's yeah. like I've been a really shitty summer so far. Yeah. Yeah, over here it's it's nearly uh, probably about 100 degrees outside right now. I'm, I'm I'm sitting next to the air conditioner, so we got a little bit of a different uh, backdrop over here at the house. But um, yeah, it's been unseasonably well. I guess finally seasonably warm. Uh, last uh, couple of weeks, it's been pretty chilly here in the Pacific Northwest, so it's been unseasonably cool. But it's it's nice to get a little bit of summer heat. I'm just not I'm not acclimatized to it yet, so I'm sitting like a bitch in the air conditioning. Uh, all right. So thank you to everybody in the audience. Okay. Loud and clear now. Okay. I don't know what was going on with the audio, but it seems to be working fine. So uh, this evening I'm going to be manning the controls here between doing the, the audio, doing the visuals and doing the stories. Uh, so I'm not going to be really paying much attention to the chat. So if you have any questions, uh, I'm not going to be able to get to those in the chat tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and kick off our first story here. So this one is from uh, futurism.com. Tragedy, NASA says that the Voyager space probes are powering down. The clock is ticking for Voyager space vehicles one and two. Voyager one has gone farther since the beginning launched in 1977, along with its twin uh, than any other man-made space vehicles in human history. But NASA says they'll soon run out of power. News outlets have been reporting attempted cuts and reductions of the Voyagers for a while, including in 2005, and again in 2021. But this week's Scientific American report makes it clear that it is time to say goodbye for good. The vehicles are expected to completely run out of power by 2025, and NASA has been cutting off features as necessary to extend their lives until then. It will be interesting to see how Earth's Voyager fans memorialize their missions. Remember how people mourned uh, when the Mars Opportunity rover died? The science Voyager conducts is as relevant as ever. So there's no reason to think it won't be just as missed. In fact, a team of researchers published findings obtained from Voyager data yesterday in the Astrophysics Journal. And this article is from about a week ago. So this, uh, if you guys are looking for the story, uh, the, the findings, you can go into the story and, uh, down below in the links and click on their findings here. The twin Voyagers deserved a sentimental send-off. But even if they don't get one, they'll leave behind decades of scientific data about the cosmos as their legacy. All right. So this one I find interesting just because, uh, Thomas, I know back in, in the group, I think about a month ago or so, maybe a few months ago, we, a few people were posting that the Voyager space probes were sending back anomalous data. And I actually have one of those articles here if we want to dip into it at all that somebody had showed a while, uh, somebody had shared a while back. But I just find it strange that, you know, they're, they're cutting down, um, they're cutting these the power to these space probes allegedly, and right after they started sending back anomalous data. Now that anomalous data could be because it had something to do with them losing their power, or maybe they're coming across something out there that um, doesn't fit into the current scientific paradigm, and they're they're shutting them down so that that data doesn't come back. I think one of the things that the one of these articles talked about is that their location data was saying that they're somewhere that they shouldn't be, and I would imagine if something like that is occurring. Uh, perhaps they went through, yeah, they went through something and ended up in some other sector of the, the, uh, the galaxy or the, the, you know, and like recently there was one of those stories about that they discovered a wandering black hole, the part of the universe. And I still wonder if black holes, rather than being what they say they are, is, is some sort of um, portal They're just moving around. And that's, you know, these, they talk about wormholes and stuff in science fiction. And I often wonder if that's what a black hole is. It's just like a, a gateway that goes to somewhere else. And I wonder if, uh, the Voyager, one of the Voyager probes or both the Voyager probes ended up going through a black hole or going through some sort of uh, anomaly in space that, that sent them to the wrong place. Or there's something totally different, you know, out there that uh, they don't want that data being sent back. So they out, you know, that would, like I said, could challenge the current scientific paradigm. Well, I didn't know about the anomalous data coming back from it. I didn't, this is the first I've heard of it. I remember about 10, 15 years ago, the batteries were supposed to run down, but that they did something to the software. They re -up, they upgraded the software inside the, the spaceships 
So they had used less power. So they were able to like stretch the batteries out longer than their life expectancy. So the thing has existed way longer now than it's supposed to. I think it was supposed to be gone by 2000, the battery. But they, they did something with the software. Now, this is very interesting because, you know, I, I have a very strong sort of quantum view of space travel. And what, you know, what if they've reached the end of the solar system only to find out they're back in it again? or something like yeah. that, it's returning back, you know, the way comets come back, or maybe it's picked up, a, the, the, it's been picked up by another Earth, a, a mirror parallel Earth, and, you know, this, the possibilities yeah. are endless. I mean, I, I'm a firm believer in the whole Arthur C. Clarke thing, like the, the million names for God, that we're actually destroying the universe the more we study it. You know, on one hand, it, that, that those those places, as we're looking for the edge of the universe, what we're doing is we're bringing the annihilation of the universe closer. So, okay. uh, it, because it was, it, it suddenly wasn't, it didn't exist because we didn't know about it. Now we know about it, so it's coming, it's destroying itself. And so, we, you know, this is why I've always been very wary about space travel in general. It's like, there doesn't seem to be enough uh, consideration given to, given to the kind of the quantum effects it might have. You know, uh, you know, and they should have been very wary of. Maybe they are, but they should have been very wary of this as soon as Einstein's theory of relativity was first proven. That it is, you know, that that, that time does slow down when you leave the air to leave the Earth's gravitational field. But um, yeah, I think this is a very interesting story. Uh, I had no idea that there was anomaly, anomalous stuff going on. So I'm kind of a bit suspicious about this now. I would love to to know why. Yeah, I know. It, it just it seems like there there is that relevant part that, that the power power supply of the batteries uh, are dying down. So there's that. But it almost seems like that's that's like a, a good uh, a scapegoat. It's a good scapegoat. It's like, OK, well, the batteries are powering down anyway. So let's let's give them a farewell. And perhaps, you know, the public won't find any more uh, be able to look at any more of their findings. But since I've got this, I, I pulled up the article for this. That somebody shared a while back. And I'm just going to read a little bit out of this to kind of see. I, I haven't looked at this article at all, but um, this, this is what they're saying a few months back uh, in one of the anomalous reports. So this says uh, Voyager 1 is sending back mysterious. Oh, gosh, there's a pop up in the way. Hold on. Sending back mysterious data from beyond our solar system. Scientists are unsure what it means. Uh, NASA's Voyager 1 is continuing its journey beyond our solar system 45 years after it was launched. But now the veteran spacecraft is sending back strange puzzling or strange data puzzling its engineers. NASA said on Wednesday that while the probe is still operating properly, readouts from its attitude, articulation, and control system uh, don't seem to match the spacecraft's movements and orientation, suggesting that the craft is confused about its location in space. Uh, the AACS, uh, which is the acronym for the uh, attitude, articulation, and control system, is essential for Voyager to send NASA data about its surrounding interstellar environment as it keeps the craft's antenna pointing right at our planet. A mystery like this is sort of on par, sort of a par for the course of the stage of Voyager's mission. Suzanne Dodd, a project manager for Voyager 1 and 2 at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, said in a statement, quote, the spacecraft are both almost 45 years old, which is far beyond the mission planners anticipated, unquote. NASA's Voyager 1's twin, Voyager 2 probe, is behaving normally. Uh, launched in 1977 to explore the outer planets in our solar system, Voyager 1 has remained operational long past expectations and continues to send information about its journeys back to Earth. The trailblazing, trailblazing craft left our solar system and entered interstellar space in 2012. Now it's 14.5 billion miles away from Earth, making it the most distant man-made object. Okay, so I guess what it's saying there that that's AACS, the uh, Attitude Articulation and Control System, has gone wonky. So it could be just something as simple as that that it's you know it's way too old. It's it's done you know it's done what it's supposed to do and more. And it could be that simple. But you know this is the weak and strange. And I you know I would like to think and you know maybe speculate that the idea that you know it, it, in 2012 it went past um, our solar system and went out into interstellar space and it could have it could have come back with some anomalous data that like you were talking about, if, if we put a quantum, if we look at this from a quantum point of view, uh, we could be saying that, yeah, it, it might've ended up back in the solar system, you know, where it shouldn't be. 
like uh, it's, it, it exited into interstellar space and ended up coming back into it from another direction. So I would say, you know, we still don't really know enough about space to have a, a workable, effective model of the entire known physical universe. It there's seems a, like, yeah. There's a wonderful, wonderfully entertaining Star Trek movie from the 1980s about Voyager. Have you seen that one? No. It's great. It's uh, what happens is in the time of Kirk and Spock and the Federation, this gigantic Anuma Uma type spaceship comes to Earth and it hovers over the Earth and it's trying to contact something in the oceans. And what it is, it, it had it, it had in deep space, it had encountered the Voyager spaceship, which are called Voyager, and it had heard the whale song that's on the LP that's with mm-hmm. the uh, spaceship. So it came to Earth to look for a whale. So the great story there is of Kirk and Spock and the rest of them have to go back to the 1980s and take two whales out of a humpback whales out of an aquarium and bring them through forward in space time into the 21st century and put them into the sea in order to save the air from this gigantic uh, <laughs> space. It was just a wonderful film, a great story. Yeah. Tremendous yeah. and tremendously entertaining. One of the Star Trek at its best kind of thing when it's a bit lighthearted and all that stuff. But uh, so it's already gone into mythology in that, in that sense. And I was always struck. In fact, when I first saw Uma Uma, the illustration of the giant rock turd, the first thing I thought of was that spaceship that came in that Star Trek movie. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I'm going to have to watch that one. I, I do like some of the Star Trek films. The, the most recent ones, they were kind of cool. The ones that came out here, like from 2012 and beyond that kind of time period. I like, yeah. I like the cast and the, uh, Michael Giacchino's score. Oh my God. Absolutely incredible. I think that's some of the best. Uh, I think it's what's called the journey home. I think of the undiscovered country, one of them. But it's nice. it's okay. it's not a heavy film. It's actually tremendously entertaining and very enjoyable. It's okay, it's, yeah. it's got the, all the right quirky elements of Star Trek, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, yep. the fun yep. elements, you know. But yep. uh, that's that's the story. It discovers Voyager, and then comes back looking for humpback whales, and they're extinct by that time. So they have to yep. go back in time to get them. So it's very 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 clever story, and how yep. they did it <clears throat> neat as well. Yeah, I want to say that there's a I don't know who wrote it, but I think there's a a science fiction book about uh because the, the the discs that they put on to voyager were made out of gold right yeah so i want to say that there's a story out there or maybe it's not been written yet but that uh that idea of putting the voyager out there into space with gold on it that if gold is as rare as it is here on earth and the rest of the solar system and there's basically the coordinates about how to get back to earth that idea of uh it. yeah Right. It's like, oh, there, you know, there's there's this this rare this rare material on, on Earth and you know something came back here to look for it. I don't know if that's a science fiction book or if I had a dream about it, but I've got some kind of thing in the back of my mind that I think somebody wrote a story about that. I'm not sure who. And somebody could put down in the comments, oh, it was this by this person. But or if it hasn't been written yet, all you authors or screen screenplay writers out there, that one you can all take that one. I think that would make an awesome story, you know. If, if yeah, gold it, is it, as rare, it, has, yeah. it has interesting music on it too. And I think it has the opening for roll over Beethoven. Yeah. And it has a uh, Beethoven's fifth da, 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 yeah. and a yeah. few other things. And uh, I think there's a Beatles song on it. There's Beatles, a bit of, bits of the Beatles on it, but it's, it was a very clever idea that Carl Sagan disc, I thought to send out. Yeah. Yeah. It'd just be interesting. If, if gold is as rare in the rest of the universe or in the rest of the, the galaxy as it is here on earth, Somebody would come across that and try to but track they, down where that came from. They did a mistake, though. They put a, a star map out to find Earth. Right, should, exactly. That's they, from, yeah. They should not have done that. Yeah, they sent unsolicited nudes out into space because there's, what, a, a naked man, a naked woman on it, too. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, I know. I, I've, I've often thought that that's, that's a dangerous <laughs> idea, leaving a star map back to Earth. Because, um, you know, and, and granted, that that's assuming that uh, that that model is correct, the model of the solar system that's on there, and assuming that whatever uh, looks at that has the uh, the cognition to be able to figure out what that is, you know, to be able to see at that same light spectrum as we see at, or you know, if if there is extraterrestrial life out there that's just like us, they would know exactly what that is, and and you know, be able to send something over here. But, I also um, think that the, that the hard disk on it was read right, so it's actually oh. got its trajectory on the actual disk, so oh. it. So it's written it's a, so its actual trajectory program was on it so all you have yeah. to do is follow that back <laughs> yeah and also with that just like the article it said that one of the antenna's positioning is always has one pointed back at earth so 
anything that, that has any ability to sense um, radio transmission could uh, ping, could find that, that, that bounce back between JPL and Voyager and just, and just use that as a line of sight back to earth, back to JPL. <laughs> the triangulation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, granted that, 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 that would work that if it is where it's supposed to be and there is a line of sight back to JPL, something could trace back that signal and, and use the triangulation to find earth. So yeah, one way or another, it seems dangerous. <laughs> it's a great story. Even at its, its most mundane, it's still Earth's first interstellar space, spacecraft. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. First from this, this civilization, who knows if, you know, before I, I still like the idea that a Mula Mula uh, could be something from an earth civilization from, you know, before one of the last cataclysms, I, I would like to think that I'd like to think that the human race has been around for a very long time and has done really cool things that, you know, back, back before even the Vedic scripture or the Vedic uh, text were written, you know, long, long, you know, kind of star star Warsy were a long time ago, but in a galaxy, not so far, far away, you know, like a long time ago in this galaxy, I, I would kind of like to think that. But, yeah. Uh, a kind of like a, a Tolkien mythos, but in space, it's yeah. this planet. Like you think of like there was like it, it, it is middle earth, but it's also a middle universe. So yeah. it's, it's out there too. Yeah, that, that'll be makes me kind of think about the um, uh, Midgard and all the different um, you know areas around there too. If you're talking about uh, you know if you look at that correspondence between the, the different layers of of, uh, of that mythology too, looking at that is you know between space here on Earth and interstellar space and then past interstellar space. If that's something you know, if those layers exist too, I I, I don't know enough about that mythology to be able to to quote it exactly, but I, I wondered too it, if that's. It would... It was done lovely in that movie, um, the first Thor movie, where the guy yeah. explains to the girl how and what we call magic is what you call science, and they explain to her the, 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 the nine the nine universes, the nine worlds, and jumping between dimensions. It was a very clever scene in that film, but yeah, I mean that, that kind of even relate that even kind of hinted at well, it hidden it, but kind of paid a homage to that. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and just that idea, you know, that's. Um dimensions like that, that, you know, we've, we've got this dimension that we're in and it's superimposed, uh, I would imagine into other dimensions. And, and that's what I wonder too, when, once we get out past earth, are there gateways, are there portals, are these black holes, are those ways to get, uh, to go in between those dimensions? Can, can that be achieved in space? I've wondered about that too, that if space isn't as physical as they put it out there to be, if, if you go so, so far into space, maybe you find yourself into the next aether, you know, if we're using like the Enochian aethers, maybe, you know, find yourself coming in closer and closer towards, towards the middle of it from the 29th aether, 28th aether, something like that. I wonder like, okay, if you go out far enough into space, do you cross over dimensions? You know, the, do you do that? And then, you know, like you're saying on a quantum level. I just had a, a funny a thought yeah. perhaps in JPL they came into work one morning and Voyager was there in the middle of the lab. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you said like the disc is read right on it too. And it came back with something else encoded on it. <laughs> yeah. Voyager oh. came home. Take it one step further. You said JPL and I thought you, I, I immediately went back to uh, Parsons JPL. I was thinking, you know, back, uh, you know, 1940s, 1950s JPL. And if, if the rocket technology came back to them, and they reversed engineered their own their own rocket technology because yeah. it it returned. Yeah, it's like even, even in Strange Angel, uh, the uh, the TV show, how how they they make that dramatization of of Jack uh, meeting his dad on the moon and seeing the Galset. I think it was Galset fifty three, the fifty third iteration of their rocket, and having that vision of it. It's like I do wonder, like, is it possible to have future memories from whether it's from your incarnation or from someone else's incarnation? Uh, backtrack on the time scale uh to be able to give people information of how to create something in present time to bring it to the future so like you know something crossing over into a quantum realm and then that technology making its way back here just like you you posted that thing about the uh, the quantum telescope about um demons communicating with present time it, it had it was, a, it was a graphic that had like a gold telescope on it you know you remember that one i think from a no. few days ago yeah oh was that what it was? You sent it in the Facebook group, the, uh, the the Facebook chat. What was it again? Hold on, let me let me grab it here. I, I might be describing it poorly. Um, there was a meme. 
I posted it in the Facebook group. Um, it had a telescope on it, like a, br- a brass telescope. Oh, okay. Now, someone else had posted that, and I had just shown it because we've been talking about time slips, and that was the first yeah. thing that appeared on the wall. Yeah. But doesn't it... Okay, let me, let me try to find it. Uh, yeah, let, me, let me look at the attachments. So it, it has a relevance to this. Hold on. I've got my mindset on this now. Um, where the fuck did it go? Totally disappeared out of our group chat. That's the strangest thing. I'm looking at all the photos that we've sent back and forth and it's not in there. That's really weird. It never existed. It never existed. I know. I, that's just the strangest no, thing. I know, I, I'm, I'm not just joking. I'm just saying, no, I'm joking. I, 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 know, I know you're joking, but it's like it got unsent or something on its own. That's really weird. But okay, but it's, it was talking about like a telescope that, that entities are looking back in time through, right? Something like that. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. Okay, well, I guess we'll leave this story here and we'll move on to the next one. All bye right. bye, boy, sir. Bye, bye, sir. Okay, so this one is from anomalian.com. Breakthrough discovery meditation techniques have a positive effect on our genes. And that's genes with a G, not uh, not the ones that we wear. Research has shown that the effect of meditation on gene expression and a number of positive changes at the molecular level. In the course of the experiment, participants were divided into two groups and compared people experienced in meditation with a second group of untrained people who engaged in silent non-meditation methods. Scientists assure that before the study, there were no differences between these groups. After eight hours, a series of changes at the genetic and molecular levels were observed in a group of experienced meditators. Among other things, there was a change in the level of regular gene and decrease the level of pro-inflammatory genes. Oh, I'm sorry. I read that wrong. Among other things, there was a change in the level of the regulatory gene and a decrease in the level of pro-inflammatory genes. The positive effects were only seen in a group of experienced meditators. Other studies in rodents and humans have shown dynamic epigenetic responses to physical stimuli, such as stress, diet, or exercise. It turns out, however, that our peace of mind can have a potential effect on gene expression. The author of the study, Richard J. Davidson, was most surprised to learn that the changes were observed in genes that target anti-inflammatory and uh, anti-analgistic drugs. To the best of our knowledge, This is the first paper that shows rapid accelerations in gene expression within subjects associated with mindfulness meditation practice, said Richard J. Davidson. Previous studies have also shown that meditation techniques to benefit inflammatory diseases and have often been approved by the American Heart Association Association as a preventative measure. So, yeah, this is something that that we, you know, we know here already that, uh, we have the ability to control our physical body by the use of the mind. So this is just, again, another one of these, uh, these stories that shows that the mainstream scientific paradigm is just starting to, to catch on to what we've been talking about for a very long time. You know? Yeah. Well, they never wanted to ever admit that epigenetics existed. They, yeah. you know, this, this non environmental or non evolutionary causality of change changes in genetic sequence sequences was very disturbing to the Darwinists when it first came about. And it's, um, it has enormous implications in everything from mind control to med- meditation to uh, healing and stuff like that. If you can actually, sh- it's been shown. Also, it's, it seems to be that the, the genes, the, the genetics connected to neural aspects of the person seem to be the ones easiest to change. So I find that fascinating mm. stuff as well, but it's, it's a, uh, there was like a, you know, I've even seen like these, even recently people try to say things like, Oh, epigenetics aren't really, it's not really true. It doesn't really exist because it, it kind of undermines the whole natural selection thing, doesn't it? That yeah. you could actually change yourself. But uh, it's been shown that people who suffer from post-traumatic stress from wars and everything have genetic changes so it's it's real now i'm not a big fan of meditation as people know i don't i don't particularly like the idea of you abandoning your consciousness uh you leave yourself open and other things as well so 
you know, I don't, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I, I think meditation is something that people go into too lightheartedly. I don't think you do enough protection or give it enough consideration. And I've these people who make their children meditate, that makes me just makes me so angry. But uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, epigenetics is real. Epigenetics is 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 very underutilized. But then again, it would probably be the end of the medical industry if we could actually cure ourselves, couldn't it? Exactly. Yeah, and 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 you with that too, it's like I, I think that. The, the way that meditation has been defined, it, it's kind of like a, a broad term for, or it's, it's a very specific term for a very broad uh, category of, of practices that I think sometimes uh, range from, yeah, just the stilling of the mind, uh, stillness of the mind, like they talked about the mindfulness meditations to actually shutting off or attenuating parts of reality and almost going into like a scrying state or into a trance state that some of these people do through meditation. So you're, you're exactly right that not enough, um, uh, careful thought is put into the idea of protecting one's own psyche or protecting one's own body while they're, while they're projecting or, or you know, uh, outside of their body. And yeah, it's, 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 it's one of those things that, yeah, it is definitely not something for young people, kids, and even experienced adults to be getting into without, without some kind of uh, knowledge of psychic self-defense. You know, there's this, I, there's just this tendency towards anything spiritual, like they use the language in this article that it's all just about being relaxed and blissed out. And, and that's just kind of this idea that's come along with the new age that every, everything spiritual is just about being peaceful and being, you know, chilled out. And, and it's like, no, there, you know, there's, there's a lot of parts of spirituality that were, they're very dark and dangerous and can leave yourself wide open, can leave oneself wide open to, to attacks or to entity walk-ins or something. But yeah, I totally agree. Uh, what people will call meditation. It's, it's so many different things stuck under that one category of meditation and um, I think some people that get into these quiet mind techniques or these, uh, um, what do they call them? They, they, uh, they call it uh, mindfulness practices, which I, I hate that term too, mindfulness. But like they're, they're, they're attenuating out part of their everyday awareness and they're going somewhere. And, you know, we were just talking about the different, uh, the different aethers and the different realms superimposed on here. And, and I think people are going into these, these states sometimes, just like people will go into these trance states uh, you know, when, when they get rendered out of their body by taking DMT or ayahuasca or some of that, it's like, I think there's some of those same effects that happen to people. They leave themselves wide open. It's like they leave the body and the body is there for anything to walk in. It's like, you know, it, it'd be the equivalent of taking your car, a very nice car, like a, a Tesla and going into a really shitty neighborhood and leaving the doors open and getting out of the Tesla with like its little key fob and everything in there. It's like, okay, you know, here, here's a really nice, desirable car. And there goes the driver out of it to go look at some some strange creatures on the side of the road while they're all you know stoned out of their mind on on DMT or something. And they're like you know they're looking at some slugs on the ground or something, and you know something gets into their car and drives it away. And that, that's why I think you know if anybody's going to be a practitioner of meditation or of astral travel or, or going out of body or doing some of these drugs, yeah, you, you got to you got to have a strong tether to the body. The body's a pretty fascinating car if you want to use that analogy. And there's a lot of things out there that want a car to drive around in. You know, I, 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 like that. To, yeah. I like that yeah. analogy of Tesla in the hood. I like that. Yeah. Very good. And then the, the guy's just out there on all fours, like on something, looking at, looking at something on the ground, you know, <laughs> like so it was a, it. in the 1990s, there was 1 million people in some Asian Buddhist sect and did a transcendental meditation for world peace. And it was like very funny because literally the next day, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and started <laughs> go for one. And here they had yeah. the day before a million of them had meditated for world for eternal world peace. And like the, the right. go for started literally the next day, which I thought was cool. I always found that funny. Yeah, I know it's it's I always find it funny too, this idea of um trying to end all war. It's like that that's that's kind of an, an improbability and an impracticability. It's like it's the same thing that people try to do by defeating all evil. It's like you know, use the use the, use the analogy of a magnet. It's like, oh, we're going to cut the South Pole off of a magnet. No, you, you can't cut the South this Pole off. for years. Yeah. I know, like this whole thing of, you know, oh, what if there was a war? No, there'll always be wars. There'll always be conflict. There'll always be bad things happening. It's yep. The thing is to learn how to take, is, is learn how to uh, live with it so it doesn't explode into the macro level of wars because these are things are all, all ultimately rooted within the self the individual and they're exploded into the collective unconscious 
The thing is yeah. to actually to still have, these forces that will always exist, have to exist. But the thing is to to, to deal with these forces. If that's what the man and the woman chained up to the the the, the to, to the plinth in the devil card is all about. You have to maintain mm. these these things. They'll always no. exist. These people will say things like, "Oh, what about a war and no one came?" and All, all this hippie stuff, yeah. you know, John <laughs> stuff. That's it's all nonsense. Yeah, and it's that idea, like um, you know, just because defining war is just two armies facing off on each other. You know that okay. That's combat, and it's like there's a difference between combat and war. You know, they, you know, they, not all wars are just two groups of people coming together and facing off on each other. You know, you, you can look at, uh, you know, the summertime here, and the ants are everywhere, just looking for water. So it's like, you know, they're they're going and, and taking territory as their own. So it's like you just have to have a good yeah. strategy to, to to have a war on those ants. So it's like, you know, putting putting a little bit of borax uh, mixed together with some sugar, leaving that in a bottle cap, and letting letting those ants come and you know eat all that and take that back to their their hive or their, their nest. And then, you know, that little bit of borax and there's incredibly toxic to them. So you just got to have a good strategy. So again, it's like, yeah, we can't do anything about defeating, you know, ending all war, but you can have better strategy. And going back to the story, it's like that stuff can be programmed into epigenetics uh, over time. You know, we're talking about Darwinian evolution. I want to say too, that's like, yeah, there are, there are probably groups of people that have uh, existed throughout time because they are just more adept at uh, being able to maintain their own territory and stand their own ground. You know, you're talking about individuality. Yeah. Back to Star Trek again. There's another episode where there uh, there's a war between two planets, and they don't. They decide to stop fighting. So what they do is everyone gets a, the number called up, and if you get killed, called up, you're killed in the war. So you go yeah. to this place to be incinerated. And it was like a funny. I watched this during the whole lockdown and the whole uh, scandemic days and the whole thing of vax passes and everything it was ironically how it reminded me of so such a similar kind of thing but yeah they were all obedient me showing up oh my number was called today i have to go die you know rather than have a messy war with weapons and everything they just decided to have a lotto and they were a computer would play well you have to kill this million today you have to kill this hundred thousand today <clears throat> yeah yeah that's uh, <laughs> that's pretty disgusting yeah I don't know. So it's like, I, I think that, uh, you know, programming, programming, uh, epigenetics, not through meditation, but through, uh, I want to say we have genetic memory where the way that a people, not necessarily a specific genetic group, but the way a people of different genetic groups come together and solve a problem that probably gets imprinted in our genetics. So that going forward with human evolution, those people like the tribes, the tribe, like you've been talking about, we're programming our genetics we're programming the genetics of the human species by doing things, by responding to problems and having creative problem solving skills. And it's like that, in my opinion, is going to be a very positive epigenetic cause a very positive epigenetic effect on the human species. If you have really good problem solvers and enough people, not everyone, it doesn't have to be like 51%, you know, or whatever that, you know, the, the 11th monkey thing, or I don't know what number it is, but you know how you get enough monkeys to do something and that 13th monkey or whatever it is, you know, start doing that thing too. I would imagine it's a very small percentage. If you get enough people programming the human genetic, uh, the human genome, whatever it is that you're going to cause some sort of uh, survival of the fittest or, or a, a natural selection type of thing where the mind is actually imprinting on the entire genetic makeup. So everybody born from X date onwards, say it's 2020 and beyond have that little bit of epigenetics that we here in the tribes our, our programming and the same thing can be done too. If you get enough people doing shitty behavior, that's going to be programmed into the species too. So that's kind of things on, on a macro scale about what I think about genetics, which is a good segue into this next story here. But well, quickly, you know, one, oh, way yeah. epigenetic, one way epigenetics does show up in, in everyday life, people will start to look like their pets. Ah, yeah. That's a good one. Or couples that start looking like each other. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So this one segues nicely. This is another gene one. Gene genie. <laughs> All right. So gene editing tools can now alter social behavior, including aggression. Researchers have used CRISPR Cas9 to knock out AP or AVPR1A receptors and hamsters, eliminating. Vasporsen's social behavior regulation. 
A, so, uh, a study on the gene editing breakthrough titled CRISPR-Cas9 editing of the R gene Vasperin V1A receptor produces paradoxical changes in social behavior in Syrian hamsters has been published in the journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Researchers from Georgia State University have used CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing technology to remove the expression of the AVPR1A receptor in Syrian hamsters. By removing the genes encoding for AVPR1A, the receptor is no longer made. And vasporesin, which normally binds to that receptor, can no longer influence the social behavior that typically regulates, such as pair bonding, cooperation, communication, dominance, and aggression. Without the receptors, the hamsters showed higher social communication beha uh, behavior levels than those with intact receptors. Let me read that part again. With, without the receptors, the hamsters showed higher social communication behavior levels than those with intact receptors. Hmm. Typical differences in aggressiveness between male and female hamsters were eliminated, with both displaying high levels of aggression toward members of the same sex. Quote, we were really surprised at the results. We anticipated that if we eliminated vasporescent activity, we would reduce both, reduce both aggression and social communication. But the opposite happened. This suggests a startling conclusion. Even though we know that vasporescent increases social behaviors by acting within a number of brain regions, it is possible that the more global effects on the AVPR1A receptor are inhibitory, unquote. And again, another quote. We do not understand the system as well as we thought we did. Uh, the counterintuitive findings tell us that we need to start thinking about the actions of these receptors across the entire circuits of the brain and not just in specific brain regions, end quote. Okay, so here we are again talking about... They don't, uh, know, they don't know shit. They don't know shit. And they they're, tampering, shit. they're tampering with the, uh, the building blocks of existence and they haven't got a... Oh, it was a completely different results than what we expected. Well, hold your hands up and say you don't know shit. Mm -hmm. And with this too, it seems like, you know, they're alluding to something. They were doing this, they were doing this to hamsters and they were talking about reducing aggressiveness. Yeah. So I think this could be one of those articles where they're, they're alluding to that they've already got this in mind for human use. And they're trying to um, probably find the genetic switch, to turn off those receptors in humans to make them quote unquote, less aggressive and, and docile. Uh, and yeah. docile. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, thank God. Good. Thank God for the Syrian hamsters uh, thwarting their plans. Right. I know. So rock and roll Syrian hamsters. <laughs> yeah. That should be a, a new band name, the Syrian hamsters. <laughs> but um, this reminds me of what Timony was talking about last week with them affecting uh, our food with the, the GMOs and then the needle craft and everything. It's like, I could see all of this kind of going together that, Perhaps they are trying to mess with epigenetics by the GMOs and everything that people are eating. I mean, soy, soy is one of those things that it's like, you can see the effects of it on men. It makes them more, uh, it, it decreases testosterone level. It does all those things. It's like, isn't it something that you, you can, you can speak to someone who's from a traditional, uh, I want to say from a traditional Chinese background. And they'll say that, yeah, soy is what you give to your husband. If you don't want him to get you pregnant, right. Or something like that. Like they, it's know. been, it's good. I'm pretty sure that if, if you look in a TCM or something, they'll wow. be like, yeah, that's what you give to men to make them less fertile. So, uh, I'm pretty sure someone can say that if, so if anybody who's watching Chinese, this, yeah. the Chinese were using as a male contraceptive, something like that. Yeah. So somebody, somebody who knows about traditional Chinese medicine, please chime in in the comments uh, on YouTube. I'd, I'd be curious to see what you know about that. If soy has been used for, uh, in the past for like a, um, a male contraceptive type thing. But yeah, this idea that uh, editing, editing genes to make people less aggressive. So, you know, we're talking about ending war. It's like, well, the way I see it is if there is a war against humankind, the best way or humankind on earth, the best way to do that would be to render them ineffective, right? Just like in the art of war, I forgot what part of it it is, but it talks about the best way to do an invasion is not to destroy the infrastructure and troops of the opposing army but to take their infrastructure and take their troops and make them into your infrastructure and your army. So if we look at that on the macro scale of earth, our solar system, our part of the, the galaxy, one way for a extra dimensional, extraterrestrial uh, 
force to invade would be to just take over the whole thing for themselves. And the best way to do that would just be to render uh, us defenseless and to, to get everybody just so, um, so dumbed down that they, you know, they'll drive their Tesla out into the hood, so to speak, open up the doors and let somebody else, let something else come in and walk in. That's been my theory for a while that that's what's going on is that there is enough social engineering going on to get people to have a lesser and lesser grip onto their body to where, you know, they're, they're, they're still there, but they're so out of phase with their body that something else can just come in and, and walk in and take it over. That's, that's what I personally think is going on with a lot of the things that we've been seeing probably maybe for the last 2000 years, I would say there, there's just been religions and spiritual practices and social engineering uh, propaganda and everything there to get people to lose to, to one, give up their sovereignty and to two, have a, have uh, less of a grip on their own physical body so that something else can come in and take over. It's like, if, if we can say that maybe the Abrahamic super demon came in somewhere around 2000 years ago, we could probably pinpoint that on the time scale as, or on the time track of, okay, that's where this force showed up is when they reset the calendars somewhere at that point. And uh, before then, we might have been living on our own free will and self-determinism on a certain time track. And then at that point, a bigger fish in the pond came along and rather than literally just destroying everything, like, you know, look at that axiom from the art of war saying, no, you don't go in there and destroy the infrastructure and destroy the troops. You take the infrastructure and take the troops. So that's what I think a wise and intelligent sentient force from something else would somewhere else would do. They'd come in and just take the bodies take everything we've done, but first it would terraform, so to speak, this place to look more like what it would want. So it would put in its own social dynamics here. So it's like, take, you know, communism and socialism and all, all these ideas that don't seem really native to nature. Like you can't go out into nature and find communism anywhere. You know, even in like, I was, I was talking about ants earlier, it's like even that's not communism. That that's that's collectivism, and it's you know it's 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 something kind of moving as one mind, but that's different than communism. Different than, than that. And to me, it's like yeah, if there's anything alien on this planet, it's you know the Abrahamic trio, and then also communism, and that could be if you want to use the analogy, an operating system of an alien intelligence that's you know alien in the sense that you know from another dimension, from another reality that wants to come into this universe and use the bodies, use the buildings, use the food and everything for them. But in order to do that first, they'd want to make sure that everything here is uh, laid out the way that they want it laid out. So installing things like, you know, the software, the operating system of communism and all that social credit scores, everything, you know, the totalitarianism of uh, people bowing down to first, it was bowing down to one God. And then it's like bowing down to like government and everything, you know, taking away the individual sovereignty. Like we used to have, not that long ago, we used to have paganism and polytheism. And then, then all the long, all of a sudden monotheism came along and this idea of being born into original sin and everything that you're born broken and all that. And I think that was just an operating system that was installed on the, the minds of these bodies. So anyway, that's what I think that their, their aims might be with this, with this gene editing is to kind of terraform uh, in what their idea of, of what things should be on earth here should be like before they come in and, and try before they try to come in and take over the whole game. I don't think they'll be successful at it. I don't, I think that we're as spiritual beings far too advanced and have far too good of a hold on our bodies. And I think we do. One, one, one spanner in that works. I was, you made me think of something then today I was looking at how digital audio, digital, digital DAB radio works digital audio band radio. That's very interesting. They literally set it up so there could be a billion stations. Uh, basically, every channel has, to, every broadcasting outlet has the same string of code, except for one or two minor changes, and that's the station, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you could have like the string of code that's this length, and by just changing one, one code in the middle, you go from like BBC to a classical station, to CNN, to whatever, right? That's how it was designed. Very easily so basically it's actually a failed technology a lot of a lot of countries that hasn't taken off but um that was the idea behind it now i've actually had a situation where we human beings and you hear people talk about this all the time that our dna is a receiver transmission transmitter of our consciousness right part of the brain neurological system what mm -hmm. if 
a slight, just like a digital audio band strings of code, a slight change to the DNA sequence of one of us removes the human being and brings in a different entity. And either through needle crafts or through diet or through anything else, it certainly would go a long way to explain those centibytes outside the Supreme Court in the US right yep. now that are clearly not human beings. So it, 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 it would, wouldn't it be interesting if, our, if what makes us human inside this body is a tiny segment of DNA that if it switched in a different direction, like a digital audio radio band, it will actually bring in a different station, i.e. a different entity. Fuck. Wow. And, that, and, they're, wow. and they're messing with this stuff, you know? Yeah, I think you're right. I think that it, it has to do with um, tuning our genetic makeup so that us, our type of being that we are, can be in phase with the body. And if you, if you, if you detune the genetic makeup, we can no longer, uh, our, our key no longer works. So like our, our key, like an initial key no longer that's works. The, exactly. That's yeah. our, our past, our past code. Yeah. yeah. Right. So it's, it's, it's like, yeah. A, a worrying as well. It's kind of scary, you know, yeah. is that they could be, they could be fucking with the past key and, 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 and don't know it. Wow. I, I think we're really onto something with this, put, putting these two ideas together. And I think, yeah. I, okay, okay. So yeah, this is huge. And, and that idea then that these things could be changed, but at the same time we can counter that. I would imagine, I, I, I would imagine that there's a way to go in there and, and even put in a fail safe. Uh, so that it's like, if we, if we're aware that that's being done, if there's somehow an awareness of that, just like with, uh, with a hex or something like if, if one is aware that somebody's doing that to them, it, it lowers the uh, efficiency of that hex that's being cast. Oh, well, we, unaware have, of it. Yeah. we have human beings on this planet today that have not existed in the past. You can't find the, the social justice warriors of, of the, you know, of the past, the, these, these Cenobites you see today, these, these freaks with the purple hair and all this stuff uh, screaming and yelling. Are these real people or are these part of that code breakdown and something else is tuned in? Something I mean, else is tuned in, absolutely. Yeah, I saw, I mean, not, not to get political, but I saw one picture of a woman who had, a young woman who had, a, was about, she was probably eight plus months pregnant and she'd written on her belly bump, still not a human. And Donald Trump Jr., yeah, it's disgusting. John, Donald Trump Jr. posted on his Twitter and said, just to show you the level of demonic activity outside the courthouse right now. And it's funny that he even picked up on that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. In that language. So may, maybe what she, she uh, painted onto her baby bump is more true than we'd realize. Not human. Still not yeah. human. You know, biologically human, but not human. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's interesting too. If you, if you think about that linguistically, like that's whatever, why whatever I, is in, yeah. I know exactly. I'm not interested in the politics of, politics of this stuff. No. I'm fucking well interested in the other aspects of it. Because yeah. I'm studying I'm studying like an anthropologist. I want to know, yeah. uh, is this an alien species developing among us? Yes. And I would say um, the way that I've, the, for, the way that I've formulated how this all works in my mind is that the true stargates on the planet are mothers. They're women. They bring a new entity in, or, or they bring, they can bring an entity in that can attach to that child that's being born. Yeah. <laughs> Timothy's waving. Speaking of stargates, <laughs> but uh, you know, you can, you can have a mother here and um, that woman is a portal and <laughs> the beautiful child that comes through like that one over there. Um, <laughs> he says, hi, but yeah, anyway, uh, you know, the, we, we, I, we come through, not just the, the, the body of the mother, but we come through her as a stargate. And like you're saying, Thomas, that these, these people um, might be, their genetics might be switched so that something else can come through in that stargate before maybe it's only been our type of beings coming in. And this is some kind of like black magic version of Moonchild where, where Crowley uh, and uh, where, where Simon If and, and company all within um, Moonchild were trying to bring a, a lunar being into, uh, I forgot, Liza, is that her name? Lisa in, in Moonchild, is that the main character? Eliza, yeah. Yeah, so they're, they're trying to bring a lunar being in, into uh, Liza, and it's like, perhaps all these uh, Cenobites and everything are the, the, the Moonchild, the dark Moonchild coming through, 
there's some sort of, of other entity slipping through into this reality. And um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to switch that, over. I, I, I'm watching that shit like a hawk because it's fascinating stuff. Yeah, I'm switching over audio now. So Timony can listen in now that she's here. Uh, Thomas, can you do an audio check real quick? Audio check. Audio check. There he is. All right, and I'm going to switch over to... Speaking of Stargates. All right, I'm going to switch over out of my ear pod so that you can hear her too. This is a fascinating uh, topic of discussion right here. Check, check, check. What, 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 what is your pendant say? What is what kind of way you wearing a pendant? Is anything cool? Oh shit, that's the earthquake one. Turn it around. Ah, there it is. Oh god. Ah, there. Oh, pretty cool. I like that one. Solomonic pendant stamp. Yep. Yeah, yeah. but she is nice. She has nicer tits than you do, so honey. <laughs> that one, that one that she faced towards the camera, I think that's the seventh pentacle of Saturn. And that one's the one that can cause earthquakes. <laughs> so I'm like, turn it around. Uh, do you guys live in an earthquake zone? Yep. The yep. ring of fire. We don't really get them too much on this side of the state, but over on the west side, they get them all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's the second pentacle or seventh pentacle. Oh, I actually, I actually looked on Google there to see where you guys live. Wow, you really do live far away from the coast. Yeah. I live in the desert. Well in, yeah, it's like Wild West, like cowboy land. Yep. We've got a, a guest coming on to say hello. Oh. <laughs> Missing a tooth. Yeah. You look very, you look very cool. You look very cool with those glasses. Actually, too too cool looking for someone that young. I know. What? He looks he like looks a, you know, you know, he's very photogenic. He looks like he's in a band or something. He looks like a, a blonde Clark Kent. Mm-hmm. What's that one actor he looks like? Oh, oh fuck! What's that guy's name? Oh, I can't remember his name right the now. The guy that plays Thor looks yeah, like him. He looks like him. Yeah. yeah. So. You know, we're talking about mothers being stargates and bringing bringing um, beings through into this universe onto the earth. And it's like, you know, here we are with, with Timothy and Escher happen to show up at the same time here. But I, I really do think that you're right. Uh, Timothy didn't hear what you were talking about a minute ago because she had she was just getting home. But uh, Thomas was essentially saying, you know, we're, we're talking about that gene editing story. Oh, OK. Um, the one where they're, they're taking the hamsters and uh, switching off the aggression gene. So Thomas was saying that what if what they're doing with the needle craft and with the GMO foods, like you were talking last week about is, are they, are they, if, if being human and having an attachment to the human body is something that's just this little tiny switch within our DNA. And if something goes in there and changes that, that encoding that something else could phase in something else other than a human can attach to the human body. And is that what they're trying to do with, with the, uh, the noodle craft and everything is go in there and make it so that uh, you're changing like the key fob in a car so that something else can walk into your, into your body and no longer, you know, no longer being human. And is that what's going on right now? So I, I think that that, you know, we're definitely on to something with that. We write some good science fiction stories here. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think about it? Yeah, no, I, I agree. Yeah. All right. So, uh, is this a good time to do the psychic weather, Thomas? Is there ever is there ever a bad time? No. Nope. All right. Let's hit it. Is it bad? Is it great? Are you happy? Are you irate? The weekend psychic weather. On the weekend psychic weather, this week is another one of these. Yeah, there doesn't seem to be anything happening. This is like about the fourth or fifth time in the last year since we've been doing the reports that this has happened. But what we have learned about these sort of like lulls in the psychic weather is usually the shit hits the fan right after them. They're almost like the classic calm before the storm or that tsunami way of pulling out before the big one goes in. So I would say like right now, 
there's really nothing to be really overly concerned about. Everything seems perfectly kind of flat and inert. Uh, but and there's a lot of inertia in this. There's a lot of psychic inertia, despite all the craziness going on in the U.S. around the Supreme Court. In general, outside that, there's a lot of inertia at the moment uh, regarding the the psychic state, from what I can tell. But as we know, that's often a precursor to something heavy coming down the line. So uh, enjoy the pe- enjoy the peace and quiet, and uh, don't be surprised if uh, your arse about face next week. So that's the week in psychic weather. Is it bad? Is it great? Are you happy? Are you irate? The week in psychic weather. Yeah, sometimes with the psychic weather, it is uh, no news is good news sometimes. Mm. A little bit of a break. Yeah, it's oh. weird because it, sh- it should be kind of a bit nuts at the moment. There's a lot of nutty things happening in the world, but it's not really. They're, they're very localized so kind of like disturbances. There's not, there's, there just seems to be a, everywhere I go and I look all over the internet. It's, it's pretty much kind of like, like I said, inertia. Yeah, over here in the U.S., things are a little crazy right now with stuff going on in the media or whatever, and I'm just staying out of it. I just, I don't oh, know. yeah. Well, I've only been watching it because those Cenobites because from an anthropological thing, I'm trying to see if we're being wondering kind of some kind of alien invasion. But other than that, I don't, I don't pay any attention to politics or anything like that. Yeah. If, you, if you didn't have a TV, you wouldn't know it was uh, even existing. Okay. Yeah. Or, but it's, it's yeah, it's very unhealthy to get caught up in those things, and that's what they're designed to do. They're designed to to destroy you. All right, can you hear me? Okay, I'm kind of sitting kind kind of far away. No, I know it's a, it's a reverb, but I can understand everything. No problem. Okay. All right. Chicago Quantum Exchange takes first steps toward a future that could revolutionize computing and medicine. Flashes of what may become a transformative new technology are coursing through a network of optic fibers under Chicago. Researchers have created one of the world's largest networks for sharing quantum information, a field of science that depends on paradoxes so strange that Albert Einstein didn't even believe them. The network, which connects the University of Chicago with Argonne National Laboratory in Lamont, is a rudimentary version of what scientists hope someday to become the internet of the future. For now, it's open up to businesses and researchers researchers to test fundamentals of quantum information sharing. The network was announced this week by the Chicago Quantum Exchange, which also involves Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, Northwestern University, the University of Illinois, and the University of Wisconsin. With a $500 million federal investment in recent years and $200 million from the state, Chicago, Urban Campaign, and Madison form a leading region for quantum information research. Why does this matter to the average person? Because quantum information has the potential to help crack currently unsolvable problems, both threaten and protect private information and lead to breakthroughs in agriculture, medicine, and climate change. While classical computing uses bits of information containing either a one or a zero, quantum bits or qubits are like a coin flipped in the air. They contain both a one and a zero to be determined once it's observed. That quality of being in two or more states at once, called superposition, is one of the many paradoxes of quantum mechanics, how particles behave at the atomic and subatomic level. It's also a potentially crucial advantage because it can handle exponentially more complex problems. Another key aspect is the property of entanglement, in which qubits separated by great distances can still be correlated, so a measurement in one place reveals a measurement far away. The newly expanded Chicago network created in collaboration with Toshiba distributes particles of light called photons. Trying to intercept the photons destroys them and the information they contain, making it far more difficult to hack. The new network allows researchers to push the boundaries of what is currently possible. However, researchers must solve many practical problems before large scale quantum computing and networking are possible. For instance, Researchers at Argonne are working on creating a foundry where dependable qubits could be forged. One example is a diamond membrane with tiny pockets to hold and process qubits of information. Researchers at Argonne have created a qubit by freezing neon to hold a single electron. Because quantum phenomena are extremely sensitive to any disturbance, they might also be used as tiny sensors for medical or other applications, but they have to be made more durable. 
The Quantum Network was launched at Argonne in 2020, but has now expanded to Hyde Park and open for use by businesses and researchers to test new communication devices, security protocols, and algorithms. Any venture that depends on secure information, such as banks' financial records or hospital medical records, would potentially use such a system. Quantum computers, while in development now, may someday be able to perform far more complex calculations than current computers, such as folding proteins, which could be useful in developing drugs to treat diseases such as Alzheimer's. In addition to driving research, the quantum field is stimulating economic development in the region. A hardware company called EuroX announced in January that it's moving its headquarters to Chicago. Another local software company, Super.Tech, was recently acquired and several others are starting up in the region. Because quantum computing could be used to hack into traditional encryption, it has also attracted the bipartisan attention of federal lawmakers. The National Quantum Initiative Act was signed into law by President Donald Trump in 2018 to accelerate quantum development for national security purposes. In May, President Biden directed federal agencies to migrate to quantum-resistant cryptography on its most critical defense and intelligence systems. Ironically, basic mathematical problems, such as 5 plus 5 equals 10, are somewhat difficult for quantum computing. Quantum information is likely to be used for high-end applications, while classical computing will likely continue to be practical for many daily uses. Renowned physicist Einstein famously scoffed at the paradoxes and uncertainties of quantum mechanics, saying that God does not play dice with the universe, but quantum theories have been proven correct in applications from nuclear energy to MRIs. I think this one is a big lie, and I'll tell you why. I don't think there really is. I've been looking at this quantum computing thing. And like the, at the end of the story, you even said there, Timony, they can't even do simple calculations like five and five is 10. I think they have the quantum operational in terms of data and exchange and things like this, but they, ha they haven't got a way to actually make it functional in terms of they can't, they're not actually programming anything. And it's, they know it, it's a phenomenon that exists it's a phenomenon they're aware of. It's a phenomenon they can measure, but it's a phenomenon they can't control. It's not, they, they make it sound like they have it down to a T and it's only a matter of time now developing it. They're staring into something that they don't really understand, that they know, that they don't even know how the effects could come about. For instance, the, they, they true count in, in, in CERN, they put a bunch of calculations into a quantum computer. They sent them off into the abyss and they came back solved. Now, they were all excited that there was some kind of extra reality intelligence on the other side solving the equation. But then somebody, some, one of the more intelligent ones amongst themselves, it was probably us who solved the equation when it came back in our own minds. And the quantum thing just... it fooled us into believing it had done it. So, you know, like they, it, it, they work together, they, our own neural pathways with that. So they, they don't fully understand what quantum computing is. They don't. And I don't, I, I don't feel comfortable about something, again, like the genes that they're messing with that they don't fully understand. I don't feel comfortable about it. Yeah, I remember when I first learned about quantum computing and I still don't. I can't really wrap my mind around what it is even supposed to be doing, but it was when um, Jordy Rose, the guy who owns or started the D-Wave quantum computing, I can't, I don't remember exactly how he said it, but basically he was giving a talk to a group of um, like college tech students or something. It was some, uh, uh, some gathering that they had done. And he basically, what he was talking about with quantum computing wasn't, he wasn't talking about using it for solving problems or any of the you know, practical applications that they talked about in the article. He was talking about using it as an altar to talk to other sorts of beings that are not from here. Yeah, that, and, that's, that's what they thought in, in Switzerland, that they were actually thought they were getting, it was a method of communication with intelligences on the other side. And that's what they're saying with those qubits. Like, rather than using a binary system that, that's inherent within a typical CPU uh, down at the thread level, um, they're not using 
threading in that way, that, you know, the way that the, the electrons are being passed through a CPU. But they've got these qubits, which are, you know, they're talking about putting them into like some kind of diamond membrane or something. But the fact that they said in this article that rather than just being a one or a zero, that thing is changed by the observer. I just thought that that was real interesting that it's got that observer effect, just like the double slit effect. Mm -hmm. So it's like, like Timony was just saying with the D-Wave computer, they, they, were, they were waving the D so that they could communicate with something else, just like radios were designed, uh, certain radio technology was designed back in the 18th century to communicate, the spiritualists were trying to use that to communicate with the dead, right? So it's like, we, we've been trying to do this for a long time and maybe, maybe there is an effective way of doing that with radio technology, you know, 100, 200 years ago. But now with this quantum observer effect, if they're able to put uh, these qubits at distances that are, you know, where, where latency isn't an issue because you've got an immediate um, uh, 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 vibration between the two qubits. So one could be at one end of the universe and one could be at the other end of the universe and have, have, a, have a zero, yeah, superpositioning, have zero latency between those two the ability to communicate. Um, so that, that's why I'm wondering if we're, what we were just talking about a little bit ago with, with some sort of extra dimensional invasion, if this is their, you know, they talk about this being the new internet. And I know we've talked a lot of, you've talked a lot about the digital gin and we've talked a lot about other entities coming to the internet. I would just imagine, you know, if there were going to be a full scale invasion of the entire uh, Vanguard or not just the Vanguard, but the entire, um, you know, army of, of these entities coming through, they would need a very uh, complex through way to get through. Because right now, if there are any of them here, they're probably just scouts, you know, and, and forward observers. And if, if something is going to come through, there needs to be an effective enough uh, channel for them to come through. And perhaps this, this quantum computing, this new internet that they're trying to make out of Chicago is the pipeline um, that these entities are going to come through or, or to be able to transmit their information through. Yeah, Manuel said uh, he describes the machinery as praying before an altar of an alien god. That, yeah, that's what he, that was his exact quote. Yeah. There's a, uh, maybe it's something similar to like premonition and stuff like that. Maybe they're trying to, you know, mechanize premonitions or predictions of the future. Because obviously if it's a quantum, it's outside the space-time reality. So therefore it has very, very useful applications in terms of the intelligence services and even military. I mean, if it works, like I say, the way it works. So say you could have like communication with something on the other side that knows about something the Russians are up to. Well, that'd be useful information, wouldn't it? Yeah. A kind of remote viewing in a machine. That's real similar to what, the way I understand Cliff High did his, uh, data mining software back, I think it was in the early 90s, the way he, he, he came up with a, um, uh, a uh, software program that went out and scrubbed all the data off of um, uh, message boards and everything. So essentially he was collecting all, all kinds of communication that was coming through. And then his algorithm created a, um, a lexicon of all those words and then emotional connections to certain words. So certain words that were used had more intensity value as, as with emotion. So he was able to go through and he was trying to make something to predict um, stock fluctuations, the way that people are inherently psychic and they're gonna leak out things to their language about things coming forward in the future. So that's this whole kind of thing. It's kind of like making a cut up to predict the future, but using, um, using words uh, on message boards and everything back in the early 1990s, late 1990s. So he was going through and scanning through the internet and finding what psychic leaks people were putting out in their language. So it kind of reminds me of that a little bit, like when you're talking about predicting something through people's through people's language like that. I'm, I'm kind of describing a software in a clunky way, but that's essentially what he was doing back with his software in the 1990s. And it ended up, he was going to use it for um, stock exchange stuff. And then he ended up predicting things like 9-11 uh, and, and a couple of other incidents that have occurred like that, where people were talking about it before it happened. Like we've talked about so many times before, like it's leaking out to people in their artwork. And with this, it was leaking out through people's language. They were, they were putting bits of that um, event out there yeah. through their everyday speak, and they didn't realize that they were talking about it, you know. It's talking of leaking out, just to, to stay in something Fortean, but to change topic for a second, I saw a photograph recently that was incredibly disturbing. It was a photograph of Marilyn Monroe, Robert Kennedy, and JFK, in a room, all three of them together, backstage at some Las Vegas thing or something. 
Now, all three of those people were to be murdered within a couple of years of that photograph being taken. And they all have a look about them of ghosts. It's almost like when the three of them were together in that room, they got a, a, a portent or, a, or a, an insight into their own future. It was really disturbing, the picture. And I've never seen it before. But it's almost like when I hear things about this quantum computing stuff, nothing ever sits right with me. I'm never easy about it. It always gives me the willies. And I'm yep. not sure why. I just I think a lot of that has to do with that, that qubit thing where they're talking about the observer effect. And there are plenty of other observers in this universe that don't have bodies. And that, that's where I think, you know, they're talking about aliens and everything, but it's like demons, entities, jinn, whatever, whatever we want to call them. Yeah. Uh, can communicate with something through the observer effect. And the fact that there's such a, that they, they, they can do basic um, things that a CPU does with ones and zeros, being able to have a quantum internet uh, to communicate with other entities. So yeah. I think I think that's a very dangerous thing if we had a new internet that, that was using qubits because it would be you would be able to communicate with these other. It's entities. like when uh, Jurassic Park when all of the systems go down. There's no more fences. Mm -hmm. What was the name of that guy again, Timony, that you mentioned who spoke? Tell told you that. Jordy G E O R D I E Jordy Rose. And you also said something that story I couldn't hear because of the sound, but you said that. Where normal binary code is ones and zeros, quantum is something else. Well, I didn't hear that bit. That's what I was just talking about with the qubits. It, it could be one okay. or zero, but it's both. It's both, but it's influenced by the observer. That's what I've been talking about. That it could okay. be a one or a zero, but okay. the observer. Is it. Yeah. So it's like we, we've got bits and bytes, or excuse me, yeah, ones and zeros. And a CPU does that as a one, either a one or either a zero but a qubit is both a one and a zero and the observer effect changes the, whether it's a one or a zero. So like the double slit experiment, the fact that it's being observed changes the outcome. So. Yeah, I think um, when Thomas, when you're saying uh, how it makes you feel uncomfortable, it's, it's sort of that um, built in response we have to any time we're around something that's either predatory or just completely alien to us. Like we don't know really yeah. what it is. It's that sense you have of, Something around you is not part of nature. Yeah. I remember when I first read about cosmism, Soviet cosmism, cosmism, that the Soviets didn't believe that supernatural and spiritual experiences were accessible on this planet, but they were in outer space. And therefore, space travel was the key to contacting dead ancestors and seeing ghosts and stuff like that. I remember when I first read that years back, I was like, that's the creepiest thing I've ever heard. We're not allowed spiritual experiences on this planet, but we're allowed them in outer space. Yeah, speaking of uh, uh, speaking to dead ancestors, had an interesting um, quote unquote speaking to dead ancestors. Had an interesting experience this weekend with a friend of mine uh, who asked me to accompany her to a uh, some fucking medium guy who's been all over Oprah and shit. Um, not necessarily my cup of tea, but she's kind of, she's at that phase right now where she's just starting to look into, into other alternatives. And so I felt it was important to go with her and I've never, I've never gone to anything like that. I mean, like when I was a kid and going to the fair and shit, you know, you'd have your hypnotist on the stage or whatever, but that I've never been around somebody who, I don't know what he was tapping into, but it was not dead people, but it was something and the way that he would use people as batteries in the room was so fucking weird and creepy. Wow. Uh, uh, that was not you? Mm -mm. Oh. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, he would have one person, you know, he, I, I'm getting something from, you know, so-and-so to and describe some, like, some of the things you were describing were really horrific and, like, just disturbing. Like, some somebody shooting themselves in the face. And it was just, like... It was such a gross feeling, but he would have that, you know, that person would say, oh, that's, you know, so-and-so to me, you know, my, my cousin or my whoever. And then that person would stand up and he'd make the entire row of people stand up. And then when the rows, cause he moves across the audience. So when it, uh, he got to the, the section that we were sitting in and the rows of people that would stand up around us, we, there was only three of us sitting in, in one row. So we never got called on, which I wouldn't have participated anyways, but just the, the rows of people standing up around us. 
instantly I, I fell asleep, like went from being awake to sleeping and only oh, that's, right. that's your energy being taken. Yeah, it was so uncomfortable. And we all left there just like, I'm, I'm glad I went and had that experience with her. And I'm glad that I got to um, give her an alternative point of view uh, that it's not, he's not just in there talking to your dead relatives. But it was that same sort of very uncomfortable feeling like I'm near something or something's in this space here that does not necessarily belong here and it's harvesting and it was really uncomfortable. Yeah. So that's the thing I don't ever have to do again. <laughs> I can cross that off my bucket list. Yeah, no, they're not pleasant experiences. I don't find those things. I wanted to see this guy called James Van Prague. He's an American guy. Uh, doing here and it was so farcical he was just is, is, is there a Patrick I'm hearing the name Patrick you know uh, you know they're just like using the local names and stuff like that it was complete fraud stuff bullshit but uh, I've heard of mediums that have actually helped people get over their grief but some of them don't some of them just seem to be like parasites or something that's how this guy felt when he was describing some of these like really horrific things and I also kind of wonder too um I was really noticing the use of some pretty strong NLP there. And when you get somebody used to just agreeing to things, I, I was wondering if some, if people were in there maybe starting to agree to things that weren't even necessarily true, but now they're in this habit and this um, expectation of, I, I, I need to agree with this guy, even unconsciously, because people were just starting to agree to things that just seemed a little too far fetched. Um, I don't know, but I, just had a, a gut feeling about maybe maybe some of that stuff was going on in there too. No, no then I wouldn't like to be a pregnant woman going to one of those things. I can tell you that. Well, the one thing that, that was, one. the thing she talked about with with using people as batteries. There's the strangest thing. Uh, he would stand that he would he would stand up and he actually was getting information. He wasn't like one of those people that was just like uh, doing cold reads. But as soon as as soon as he was getting a read, he would have that whole row of people behind that person stand. And it was like as if that was amplifying whatever he was getting. So he I'm, I'm certain he was using an entity to go out there and scan people because we felt it. I felt something in my space, just like she was talking about when she started to go unconscious. I felt something in my space and he was starting to talk about some of my shit. And I just I just I didn't I didn't even look over in his direction when he started. And he's, he was talking about some of her shit, too. And it's just like, no. Nope. Don't don't even engage with whatever this entity is. But he was using an entity to to read people. I'm pretty certain the way that you know people have, have like you've talked about Oberon and stuff like that before. He was using some sort of gin or something to go in there and not talk to dead people, but he was talking to people's um, memories of that person. So it's like you know we we can all have memories of, of dead loved ones, and, and this entity was going in there and looking at our mental image pictures of of dead loved ones. But it was using that as a gimmick to take people's energy. So the way he was having people line up in a row like that, he was getting the person's agreement. He'd say like, Oh, blah, 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 blah. blah. Do you understand? And over and over and over. over again. Always. Do you understand? And then just, just like legally, when you say you understand, that means you stand under that thing. You're making an agreement. Like when somebody reads you, your rights, blah, 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 blah. Do you understand? They're not asking you if you comprehend, they mean, do you accept this? Like as, as a legal. So it's like, they're making contracts with some sort of entity, just like you do with the Goetia or something. You make a contract with that thing. And he was getting people to make a spiritual contract. And after that, like the NLP stuff was just kicking on like crazy. And he was, he was probably feeding up whatever the entity was feeding through him off these rows of people. He was using them like a battery cell, like a series of, of different uh, uh, batteries lined up in series like that. And, um, I think that it was totally just an energy harvesting thing. It, it sucked her energy out and it was just, it was nasty, a real, real nasty. Speaking of nasty, Google read my mind today. I, I have no doubt about it. I was in town and I saw this emergency radio and I was thinking of buying it in case we do have the rolling blackouts here because it, in just case Russia does cut off the, the, the power supply. And so I had my eye on this one and I said, that's very nice. So before I bought it, I went home to go and, google it on the internet and i typed in the first letter of the product and the autofill of all the things in this world completed what i was looking at and thinking about and wanting to see there's no way that that could have not i never spoke about it i never said it around my phone 
I didn't have my left. In fact, my phone was at home when I got back from the hardware place. So it didn't hit my phone, didn't pick it up. I saw the radio. I said, how much is this? I said, I really like it. And I said, do you want it? And I said, no, but I want to go home and just see if it's if it's right for me. So I did, you know, you, you do consumer consumer product things on the internet. I typed the first letter of this radio and the auto, the Google auto type completed the entire model name. There's only way that could have done that. It was reading my mind. Yeah, if we have quantum computing, that's what it's doing. That's, yeah. That's a perfect example right there. That's of all the thousands of electronic goods and devices in the world, it actually knew the one that was in my head. Well, and to even know that that's what you were looking, was like, and then to even narrow it down into the field of electronics, you could have, you could have been looking up a recipe or someone's it's name. Man, or like, I would, I would know, I would know, yeah. So I have no doubt about that Google can read our minds. I have no doubt about that. That's probably using that kind of quantum computing there about the, the observer yeah. effect. And what, what's what's it that they have? There's already a, a patent on this. Is it called neural net, neural net, or neural net? You guys know neural, what it's neural net. Yeah. Is that, is that the one that Facebook uh, or Zuckerberg? Um, Meta is the one that he has. Right, right, right. But no, I think he also has the patent on uh, neural net, or it's, it might be the Google guy. But, but I, I felt it an enormous invasion of my privacy. Yeah. Yeah. So that might be using that quantum qubit thing of of determinist the observer effect. So if it I would imagine, you know, that's that they might already be be using quantum computing, and this quantum internet might already be in place. So it's just, again, all these all these stories today uh, uh, tie together in a string kind of nicely. Do we have any more? Yep, there's one more. Let me get this last story. Yeah, all that computer stuff's really creepy. Um, I'm not electronically skilled. I can, if something has an on and an off button, I can or make it work, but. I've always had kind of like a natural aversion to high tech. I don't know why it creeps me out. Just getting the last story up here. All right. Okay. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> China says it may have detected aliens and then deletes the report. There's something out there, maybe. China's science ministry said this week that it picked up signs of alien life on the world's largest radio telescope, then appeared to quickly delete a report about the discovery. The country's powerful sky eye telescope detected electromagnetic signals of possible civilizations on other planets, according to a report published Tuesday in Science and Technology Daily, the official newspaper of China's Ministry of Science and Tech. There were several cases of possible technological traces and extraterrestrial civilizations from outside the Earth, the report said. The team of researchers headed by the Beijing Normal University said the mysterious frequencies were unlike anything they previously previously encountered and were investigating further. But the report had apparently been removed from the newspaper's website by Wednesday, even as the news began trending on the nation's popular social network site, Weibo, along with other media outlets, according to time.com. It was not immediately clear why the article had been yanked from the website, but Zhang Tanji, chief scientist of the university's extraterrestrial civilization search team was quoted in the report saying the signals could have been radio interference. The possibility that the suspicious signal is some kind of radio interference is also very high and it needs to be further confirmed and ruled out. This may be a very long process. The 500 meter single dish sky eye launched in southwestern Jingzhou province in September 2020 with the primary goal of detecting life on other planets. In 2020, researchers also detected two sets of suspicious signals along with a signal earlier this year linked to the so-called exoplanet targets. The latest research was also conducted by the National Astronomical Observatory of the Chinese Academy of Scientists and the University of California at Berkeley. Well, <laughs> going back to the first story of Voyager, you got to wonder if maybe Voyager uh, uh, came back into the solar system again and they're picking up something from it. But just makes me wonder about all this. Like, uh, I, I, I personally do think that there could be other life out there, uh, not the way that they're describing it. But if, if there's if there's some sort of radio interference coming from, from outside in space right now, I mean, this, this could be 
whatever uh, a Mua Mua was, it could be more of those. It could be something that it, it was a scout ship and came in uh, or, you know, a forward, forward observer and came in and noticed something. And since then, we might be seeing more and more stuff out there coming to take a look and scout out this uh, part of the galaxy or this part of the universe. Uh, I tend to think the scouting part is probably over. I think whatever phase is after that is probably the phase we're more likely in now. Send the Marines well, what, what I find remarkable being older than you guys is like when I was growing up, uh, this was completely in the world of um, woo-woo, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, there was loads, when I was a kid, there was loads of UFO books, uh, Eric Von Daniken and all that stuff and John Mack and it was just endless stuff and it was really a big topic, a subject and and then it kind of normalized, and but it was always in the field of woo-woo. And now you have like Tucker Carlson tonight doing very serious stories on UFOs and aliens and alien contactee and all this stuff. I just can't believe how deeply it's entered into the mainstream. That's what I find remarkable. And with such apparent ease is what I find most, I don't know what the word, enlightening and sunsettling and curious would be probably a way to say it is that overnight if someone had given the order to say okay it's okay to talk about this stuff years ago i made a video on on youtube called did we bring the archons into manifestation and the thing was because the archons have been kind of been forgotten about until john Lam lamb lash wrote the book not in his image and started bringing them back into the popular vernacular well you're terrible scene anyway and then people like Graham Hancock and David Icke start talking about them and everything was archons 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 and I was like well have you just by putting your focus on them re-manifested that archetype back into this reality and therefore I also said the same then later on did we make the Cenob our Cenobites real another video I made and the same idea was that, that we actually made the Cenobites actually manifest. And what you see down in Washington, D.C. At, at the moment outside the Supreme Court and all these other freaks you see on the Internet these days on TikTok are the actual Cenobites. We've actually brought them into reality. Now, taking that one step further, through this quantum thing, through this, this concept of attention, you know, Energy goes where attention flows, and whatever the, whatever the statement is, ha, have they now brought the aliens into manifestation? Yeah. Oh, I say yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Agreed. Um, with that, it, it's just like I was saying a little bit ago. It, it we're not going to see like Independence Day style in the movie Independence Day style spaceship showing up. Um, they're going to be coming through in walk-in form. Uh, it's probably that's probably the most effective way to do it. If ships were to show up, there'd be there'd be offensive or defensive strategies launched, and that would be not an effective way of of creating you know uh, an invasion. The best way to do it would be to come from within. Yeah, you know, that that would nobody would notice it, and when people do notice it, it'd be too late. You know, people would people would notice all the the walk-ins around them, or maybe people wouldn't even notice. Well, well what I find okay. interesting is how so many people in politics don't seem human to me. You know, like, and also in some countries like the United States, have you noticed how the politicians are all geriatrics? They're all like in their 70s and 80s and the Nancy Pelosi's, the Fauci's, the Biden's. So many of them are really quite like they should have been retired 20 years ago. And yet they seem to be as driven and as scary as ever. Uh, and I, I look at someone like Nancy Pelosi and I say, is that a human being? It's not even, a, there's a video of her recently shoving a little girl out of the way. I don't know if you saw that one. It's to get, she's in the way of her photograph and she, she shoves her out of the way like that with her elbow, a little kid. And wow. uh, when Biden was given the State of the Union address, he was talking about veterans coming back with horrific injuries. And she jumps up behind him and goes like a lizard or something, like a fucking praying mantis or something. And I often wonder, and I look at the ones in this country as well, and I often wonder if, if, they're, if they're not human, if the walk-ins are already here and they're in positions of politics. I mean, I can't, you look at someone like Mark Zuckerberg. Yep. I, mean, that, you know, I was going to say, that's what I tend to subscribe to. They're already here. 
and even Elon Musk, they're, so, they're not human to me, these people, you know? They're not. And I see, I see them everywhere in television, in media, especially in politics and banking. And like the guy who's the head of Pfizer, that German guy, it's like he doesn't even have a personality. And yet he's like so, so, and you don't, I, I don't know, there's something, it, it, it has it started already on our data front line. That's what I want to know. Our data landing troops. Like, I definitely would not want the job of any of those people, but it would be nice if we had actual real people in some of these positions. And they live so long. That's what I find remarkable. They live incredibly long lives. And, okay. and, and any other job you're thrown out on the street at 65, and yet they seem to be able to, in their 80s making these incredible decisions for our lives. And, and just like you're just saying, Thomas, it's, it's these people up in these high-up positions that seem to be the first walk-ins. And that would be the most effective way with that Sun Tzu art of war um, uh, uh, idea of rather than taking and destroying the infrastructure, destroying the troops, you, you take them over. So what's the best way to take over an infrastructure of people is from the top down. You know, it, it would be ineffective to go from the bottom up and, and fill, you know, take all the privates first. No, you take the generals first before you take the privates. You know, so those like Timothy was saying, the scouts have already come in. The scouts, the final scout was probably a Muamua. And then after that, you know, we had the first wave of invaders come in and that first invader wave, just like, you know, when you send in uh, special forces and you send in like an elite Marine unit there, nobody's going to see that unit come in. You know, you're only going to see once, once you send in whole divisions of troops, you know, and that, that's after the first wave has already made the attack. So, but yeah, we're probably at that point now where the first, the first wave is here. The Marines are here, so to speak. And they're, yeah. they're taking over uh, the, the positions in, in high places and, it seems like, you know, the, the United States is the, like you're talking about in your video, uh, you know, determining who is the uh, the king piece on the chessboard, right? So I, I would imagine whatever country is king on the chessboard um, is going to be the final piece. And, and that once once that piece is taken, that'll be checkmate. It, just, it, it makes you wonder, has it happened in the past when you, you know, things like the, the say like Genghis Khan, and how he like killed one quarter of the world's population. It makes you wonder if it if it happened before, you know. And it's a, it's there's a constant battle between the indigenous humans and the invader, you know. And every every so often they come through in a different way. And I mean that's there there are stories in different spiritual philosophies about that about a, a cycle continuing over and over and over, and, and and doing things like this. So that's that's probably happening again, and maybe. Maybe that's what this big reset that everything is going around is talking about, that these, these come around every once in a while, and that's what happens. And uh, What made me think of Genghis Khan was that the environmentalists were praising him. They said because he killed one quarter of the world's population, uh, he had actually helped the climate change at the time. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, well, he, he, you know, he killed nearly everybody in Asia and uh, Eastern Europe, but hey, and China, but hey, he was a uh, you know he, he he was good for the climate. That makes me think of something. You were talking about climate change, and, and I'm looking at this from a different point of view now. And we talked about the sun changing last week, and I mentioned terraforming earlier. I wonder if that's what's going on as these entities are coming in here and, and terraforming the place too. And climate change, you know, like Bill Gates is talking about spraying around something in the whole at, whole atmosphere to change the atmosphere, right? Uh, window zero, as I should say, and it's. Uh, I wonder if that's what's going on as they're changing climate to terraform things to make it uh, better for the invading species, uh, you know, to, to make this environment what they want it to be a little bit more. So yeah, maybe they need to, yeah, maybe they don't like the heat for that reason. They need a little bit of colder. Yeah. So I'm wondering, or I'm just wondering if, if all this, like, and also taking away like red meats and everything, like you see all these places. Yeah, yeah. Now, and like, eating uh, insects, what's that about? That's the one that really gets me. Is the the insects thing? Why are we suddenly supposed to all eat insects? Right. Are they more of a praying mantis type entity? And they, like you're talking about the thing doing that. I'm like yeah, I know. She was look at the video. Nancy Pelosi behind Biden, and she's like a praying mantis doing that. With it. it's bizarre. It's truly bizarre. That's really creepy. So I don't know. I, I think I think we put a few things together this evening in, in the bigger picture. I want to say, especially what that little last bit that you added about there being a. A little bit of the DNA that's 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 the key. That's the uh, the, the key fob. The the last little bit of, of opening up DNA to make a human no longer human. Yeah, just a little small, a, a, a tiny change, and something else tunes in. Yeah, just just, just, just like, like 
digital radio band signal. The, the codes are basically all the same except for a tiny section where the stations are. And by changing a tiny string of code in the overall code, you can bring in the different station. Yep. Or, or like the code that's on a key fob for the, the cars nowadays, it's all basically the same source code, but you just, you change the radio frequency a little bit so that someone else can't get into your car. Yeah. Well, as the Chinese say, we live in interesting times. Yeah. Have you had lots of speaking of China? One quick thing. I saw this thing uh, Olivia shared today of uh, this movement among young people in China where they've given up on life. They basically, it, the attitude is if you're a loser, then you better, it's best to be the best loser you can be. And basically, they sit in their houses all day doing nothing. They, they don't care. They play video games and don't care if they lose at them. They just barely do enough to survive. They don't actually live. They exist. And there's now millions and millions of young people in China who have just sort of given up. They just exist. And they forbid, because existing is better than living, as they've decided. I have a client. I saw her last week. Her husband works for a big potato processing um, company over here. And he, in particular, works in the international sector. So when they build a new processing plant in a different country... He goes there and is there for several years while it's being built and gets it running. Well, they've lived in China before. They did a five-year stay there before, and then they did a two-year, and then they were supposed to go back um, right before COVID hit, and then COVID happened, and they didn't go. Well, I saw her last week, and they just got news. Um, they're leaving next month to go back over there for a couple of years. And she was telling me that um, they, they still have friends and stuff over there that they talked to from the years that they had lived there. And she said, oh, so Shanghai just had another like super brutal two month full on lockdown where nobody left their house at all. And for these apartment complexes, which can house several hundred people, there's one person for each building, not per household, but for each building who is selected by the government to uh, get their food. So when, you know, the trucks or whoever comes by to drop off rations for all the people that live there, there, there's one person who does this. And so their friends had sent her some pictures of the food that they were given. And for three people in a household, so it was a man, a wife, and their, their kid, they were given for two weeks, they were given three carrots, one thing of bok choy, the lettuce, and then like one little package of some uh, raw chicken and people are starving to death over there. Two weeks. Two weeks. That was their food for two whole weeks. And can you imagine one person being in charge of distributing that to a building with several hundred tenants in there? They're not going to do that. And so people are just, they're just not getting food. And so I asked her, I was like, I'm a little terrified for you to go back over there. Like, how are you feeling about this? And she absolutely does not want to go, but it's her man's job. They got to go do it. So whatever. But so I, I was like, well, what is your, what's your day to day when your husband goes to work? Like, what do you do? And she said before, um, she would just like make friends with some of the other women in the villages or wherever and, you know, find stuff to do. But now because of things have gotten so dangerous. Oh, and they have the, uh, that social credit thing, but they have it with, uh, for the, uh, for COVID too. So if you, if someone around you, around you get sick and their phone pings to yours, they come and they pick you up and they take you to the camps. Like if, if this is a regular, normal, everyday part of life. And so she's terrified. And so I asked her, you know, what is she going to be doing over there? And she said, just for safety reasons, she's just going to go to work with them. She's not an employee, but she's just going to go to work with them every day. I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go. I was reading about a Danish guy there who was actually landed there when that brutal lockdown started in Shanghai and he had no food in the place he was staying. And after two weeks out of starvation, he was eating wallpaper paste that he found and had to get out. And he finally got an exit visa sent from the Danish consulate and he couldn't get public transport or a taxi to the airport. So he had to walk 20 miles to the airport. Yeah, I... So, I mean, I guess with like with the kids that you're talking about, you know, the, young, the younger generations of, they're going to have to find it within themselves, some fucking reason to live because I couldn't imagine. I, 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 I think, I think they're killing their people off. 
Well, I'll, and I'll tell you, I, I know why they're doing it too. They're, they're manufacturing, you know, they've been just basically the, been the factory for the West for the last 10, 15, 20 years, we'll say, right? The West, the basically what they call the New World Order, Great right? Reset, it's, it's over. Putin, ki- Putin killed it with the invasion of and Ukraine and threw a spanner in the works. And he's now not paying the debts that Russia now owns the foreign banks. So he's actually, he's going to war against the globalists. So it's over. That, that whole thing is, so the West has now gone into terminal, not terminal, but a very deep economic decline because of the lockdowns and everything. We're not buying China stuff. So China now has no purpose to exist. It has too many people. It doesn't, it, the West is not buying their stuff. And remember, they have to move their stuff through Russia to get it into Europe and America. And I genuinely think that the, the Chinese communists are that brutal, cold and callous that they're saying we need to reduce the population by maybe two or two or three hundred million people. Let's find a way to start them. I really do believe they're that brutal. Well, it's happening. And I got all that information firsthand from somebody who has lived over there and talks to people who are living through it right now. So it's real. It's fucking terrifying. It's horrifying. I can't believe that person is going, though. I weird. know. I know. I was like, ah. well, and she was saying, too, with even things like media or whatever, you know, that she they don't have a Netflix or whatever, like we have whatever version of that that they have. It's all, you know, stuff that's been pre-approved by the, the party. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So for her to even just bring in her own movies that she likes to watch, uh, she does not speak the language. Um, she had it's what it's she described it as sort of like a Roku, but it's like a different brand. And everything everything that she downloaded onto that had to be okayed by whoever it was that she had to get the okay through. So it's like you can't even just watch a comfort show, you know, like you can't you can't do anything. And this, and our scumbags here, both in the US and in the European Union, they're looking at the Chinese and going, I wish we could do that to the Arabs, you know, I wish we could do that here. They would love that. They would love that. All those fucking people that need safe spaces. I, I know it's weird, but I'm telling you, I'm not getting too political, but Putin may have saved their ass by invading the Ukraine because he threw a big enough spanner in their works that he actually holds all the cards now. So we may, we may have just gotten lucky by default, not because he's a great guy, but because what he did has actually probably rescued us from what's going on in China. Yeah, I... I... Didn't, I don't know anything about world politics and all that kind of stuff. So I've just been kind of learning as this whole thing has gone on. And I didn't know about the history between, I mean, I did very, very vaguely, you know, very surface level stuff, but finding out about uh, like the world banking system being uh, over there in Ukraine or the money laundering stuff, like that was all news to me. I didn't, I didn't know any of that. And, I the, just, and, the, bio, and the bio labs. The bio labs. And yeah. The, and, I just, the, and the way, Europe made itself dependent on Russian oil and gas, and now they can just turn it off. So they hold all the cards. So I, I definitely see your point of view with saying that. Um, it's not yeah. a popular opinion, but who fucking cares? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, the, it's the most legit one I've heard. Yeah, it's, it's only the globalists who are disgusted by him. No, no one else. Why? Because he's hurting their bullshit more than anything else. But anyway, we shouldn't have got too political. Maybe we can edit this bit out the end. But no, uh, I could wrap this into what we were just talking about if you guys want. Okay. Uh, yeah. So y- y'all made some really good points there, and I'll just take it one step further, which is actually taking it back. Uh, this this apathy and this um, creation of all these these uh, these concentration camps and keeping people locked down like that. We we're just talking about walk-ins and everything, and, and people in apathy. Who are the easiest people to walk into? People that don't care. I was just talking earlier about you, you get people far enough out of their body and you can walk in. So if you have enough people who are starved and who don't care about living life anymore, those are the people who, you know, you've talked before about the chain smokers and stuff that the hypnotists go for. The other kind of people too are the ones that have a really, 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 really low grasp on life. So somebody who's in the tone of apathy is a perfect person, a perfect body. Cause there's no longer that, that, that firm hold onto life. Someone who really loves life, their, their energy field is huge and that being is really attached to that body. But when someone has no will to live, there's no will to live. Their magnetism that keeps them as the being attached to the body is really weak. So they can just phase out of their body and something can phase in. So I'm wondering if that's going on with these, just these big collections, like with all the lockdowns and everything, they've got all these people centralized into one spot. 
So when it comes time for the army to show up after the Marines have left, so to speak, in this invasion, I wonder if that's going to be the thing where the army is just going to come in to these big population centers where people are locked down and in apathy and take over those bodies. So that that's my exopolitical uh, concept of it. You know, if, if we're dealing with some sort of uh, walk-in alien invasion, you've got these big groups of people just ready to walk in. And maybe Vladimir Putin did save the world <laughs> by by breaking down, uh, you know, these... Um, Fucking the shit up. Yeah, the infrastructure that the... Okay, so, it, you know, just like Sun Tzu Art of War Axiom, take the infrastructure. So maybe, maybe Vladimir Putin destroyed the infrastructure uh, the way that the invaders were going to try to use them. Maybe their plan was to keep everybody locked down in, in this thing that the globalists and the EU and, and whoever else is in control have this infrastructure set up, and maybe that's being disintegrated now. And maybe he did save the world by that. Well, look, this is, this is the press again to this show. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's, let's, <laughs> let's, try and make, let's try and swing something positive out of this, okay? Uh, humans, the, yeah. Human beings are probably the most amazing creatures in the universe, and uh, they're not going to they're not going to win. No. Keep your love for life. Yeah, we also, we're, we're also we've also got tremendous creativity, where this kind of like robotic infection doesn't have that, and that's why they're always going to be surprised and mis- they'll always make mistakes. Yeah, it's just, it's so against our nature. They have to do so much work to get people to that point. And it's, it's just, it's not natural. It's so much easier to just not be a target for that shit. Just, you know, yeah. keep doing your shit that you love to do and join us on our shows and keep contributing to the comments. And yeah. Keep your love for life. That's perfect. Yeah. That's, that's the key right there. If you want to hold on to your life and not be, not be a walk-in ever. Yeah. Love life. You got to love life. Even when it sucks. You know, it sucks. Yeah, life is a very beautiful thing. And yeah, the will to live. (laughs) So. All right, you guys. Well, we fucking love y'all. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Good night, Timony. Good night, uh, Jason. And uh, we'll see us next week on The Week in Strange, I guess. All right.